Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash. By popular demand, we are relaunching this week in prophecy. We've had a hiatus for several weeks, but we are reinstituting it, and it shall normally take place on weekends, henceforth and hereafter, until and unless the Lord dictates otherwise. I've recently returned from the Far East. I shall be going, Lord willing, to Great Britain, but at the moment we are in California, and I'm happy to be with you today, the 16th of September, 2018. Global events are often framed by what transpires in the Middle East. This week in prophecy, there has been more negative news delivered to the Palestinian Authority and the regime of Ahmoud Abbas. That is, their campaign effort to persuade the Democratic Party of the United States in anticipation of the midterm elections in November to adopt an Israel-unfriendly policy, even critical of Israel, following in the footsteps of Barack Obama, who motivated Great Britain, New Zealand, and other countries to vote against Israel in the UNESCO vote in the United Nations, declaring that Israel has no right to its biblical sites, including the Wailing Wall. These were the efforts of Barack Obama and the Democratic Party. Trying to build on these efforts, the Palestinian Authority has launched its campaign to try to motivate the Democratic Party further against Israel. Now let's understand, by all statistical accounts, by every survey, the Republican Party of the United States, and we are not political, I am not a Republican, I'm an independent personally, and Moriel has no allegiances to any political party, we're simply stating facts, approximately 81% at least of registered Republicans in the United States are pro-Israel, are sympathetic and to Israel and its cause, while supporting the Democratic Party for Israel is down to about 20%. This includes the abandonment of Israel by many left-wing and left-center Jews. Now, what is happening has to be understood in terms of the internal conflict, the schism within the American Democratic Party. Seizing the opportunity of left-wing Jews like Bernie Sanders and his syncophants, also other people who are unfriendly to Israel within the Democratic Party, certainly the deputy chairman of the Democratic Party, the Muslim Congressman Ellis, Keith Ellis, we are seeing these efforts by the Palestinian Authority to pull the Democratic Party into an anti-Israel direction politically. Well, it has not worked at least this time. Democratic Party leadership has stated categorically that they will not be drawn into an anti-Israel position in response to the lobbying by Ahmed Abbas and the Palestinian Authority. They might have done so had it not been an election year, and let us remember, it would not be a precedent. The policies of Barack Obama were firmly hostile to Israel, not only in the Iran deal, but more so in the UNESCO vote, declaring that the Jews had no right to the Wailing Wall. He lobbied other countries to vote against Israel, even though the USA abstained, which he was forced to do for political reasons. No president has been more hostile to the existence of Israel and its cause and security than Barack Obama. Nonetheless, this week in prophecy, the Palestinian Authority were told by the Democrats it will not work. There are still enough traditional Democrats in certain states such as New York, New Jersey, and Florida who are supportive of Israel and enough financial support for the Democratic Party and its candidates coming from diasporic Jews in the United States to make it too politically costly an adventure. Even though Barack Obama had done it, he did not do it at election time, and even though only about 20% of Democrats are pro-Israel as compared to Republicans, independent conservatives, etc., Meanwhile, this week in prophecy, there has been a recurrence of violence along the Gaza-Israeli border. Balloons continue to fly, setting fires near Kiryat Gat. Kiryat Gat may sound familiar to you as the biblical home of Goliath, but today it is an immigrant community mainly composed of former Soviet Jews from Russia and the Ukraine. Fires have been set by the balloons carrying incendiary devices from the Gaza Strip. 
but 500 Palestinians attacked Israeli Border Patrol military, uh, causing injuries. They have used Molotov cocktails, setting tires alight, throwing rocks, slingshots at the usual projectiles. The Israelis responded uh, with some casualties, but three Palestinian Arab militants were shot by the Israeli authorities in response to this latest Gaza attack this week in prophecy. It takes place, however, at a time when there has been a spate of increased knife attacks almost randomly against Jewish Israelis by radical Muslim Palestinian Arabs. Uh, there's been at least one recent case of a death and now another one near Efrat. These knife attacks are becoming quite commonplace and are bringing about a response from the Israelis where there is not an effort anymore to try to simply make arrests. These people carrying these knives and doing these stabbings are being seen increasingly as fair targets and are being shot. A 17-year-old who stabbed someone this week in prophecy uh, with a knife was simply shot dead. Uh, again, this is unfortunate. No one wants to see this. But Israel has a right to defend itself, and it's the only way to deal with radical Islam. The only way to deal with militant Muslims is the way that they deal with each other. This week in prophecy, Syria claims to have shot down Israeli missiles that were fired at targets in and around Damascus airport. There was a major strike at 9.50 p.m. last Saturday, this week in prophecy. The Israelis have supposedly, or alleged to have been targeting, new armament deliveries, new armament deliveries coming to the Assad regime into Damascus International Airport and have fired missiles from inside Israel at these targets. The Syrian claims to have downed some of these missiles remain unconfirmed, but it almost certainly happened that the Israelis have attacked these new armed shipments. Now we have to understand this very toxic and confused environment transpiring in Syria to understand what is happening. What is happening is this. At the same time in the United States, where you have a division in the Democratic Party between a radical socialist element and traditional Democrats who are moving increasingly to the left to prevent themselves from losing votes to the socialist wing, this socialist wing is increasingly anti-Israel. It's increasingly pro-Islamic radicalism. It's increasingly hostile towards the traditional American position in the Middle East, increasingly. At the same time, these political divisions in the United States that we've seen between the actress Nixon and, and Andrew Cuomo in New York, Cuomo won the election, but had to move politically to the left further himself in order to do so. There is this general, general trend. These kinds of schisms emanate in part from what's happening in the Middle East. There are no good guys anymore. In Syria, there are no good guys. You have the Assad regime, backed by Russia and Mr. Putin, aligned with Iran. Not good. Iran is in bed, of course, with Hezbollah and openly hostile to Israel. Second, you have those who oppose him, but these are dominated by Al-Qaeda and ISIS, who the United States entered Syria itself to destroy. So the arch opponents of the Assad regime are ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Why are they fighting? They are fighting not over any overt political or ideological aim. It is a religious war between Sunnis and Shias. It is the extension of the conflict between Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, the Emirates, and Iran. It is another version of what you see or what we witness taking place transpiring in Yemen. It is the Sunni-Shia conflict come to Syria, having arrived at the borders of Israel in Lebanon and at the Golan Heights. So you have the opposition to Assad who are no better than he is. There is a third faction 
largely made up of moderate Syrians and also of Kurds. These Kurds, however, are hated by the Turks and they're largely concentrated in eastern Syria and are in league with the United States. These are the closest there is to a positive faction. So the United States and Israel have a dilemma. Their dilemma is they don't like Assad and Syria because they're in league with Iran. On the other hand, they certainly do not like Al-Qaeda or ISIS. There's no one to back. The only place there is any viable partner is in eastern Syria where there's a Kurdish population similar to what we have in northern Iraq. These are about the only people that can be trusted in Syria. There are no good guys. So Israel and the United States are in a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario. Additionally, these anti-Assad forces, usually dominated by either Al-Qaeda or ISIS, have been responsible for the decimation and persecution of Christians. Thus, up to a point, Israel and the Trump administration have been quite willing to allow even the Assad regime to kill these people, given the fact that the Americans and the Kurds themselves are at war with ISIS. But they're caught in a quagmire between the proverbial rock and a hard place. They don't like the Iranian-aligned forces of Putin and of Assad, neither do they like the opposition. The only place the United States has a firm ground is in eastern Syria. This week in prophecy, the United States Marines, working together with anti-Assad rebels who were moderate, most of them Kurds, carried out military maneuvers around the El Taf base. This is an area where Syria, Iraq, and Jordan come together triangularly in their borders, called the Syrian Democratic Army. Thus, even though ISIS may be eliminated by both the United States and its allies and by Mr. Putin and the Assad regime, the United States will still retain an area of control or influence in Syria close to the Jordanian border and close to Iraq in eastern Syria. Uh, Assad's will not be able to consolidate power as matters presently stand. He has launched, with the backing of Mr. Putin and in partnership with the Iranians, a massive assault on a final rebel holdout area of Libya in northern Syria. However, he was approached this week by Mr. Tagib Erdogan, who's meeting with Mr. Putin, and the Kurds are the opponents of the, the Erdogan regime, but the Erdogan regime are proponents of the anti-Assad forces. What a confused mess. On one hand, we see an alignment of Turkey with Iran and with Russia. At the same time, Turkey is partnering with the United States against the final Assad, Iran, Putin backed efforts to smash the final major stronghold in Western Syria of the anti Assad forces in Idlib. The Trump administration warned that the United States would retaliate if chemical weapons were used by the Assad regime that the United States would directly attack Assad's forces. Mr. Putin knew this, and he knows that Mr. Trump says what he means and means what he says. The United States has already, on more than one occasion, launched direct attacks against the Assad regime. Thus, between the pressure of the United States and the pressure of Turkey, Mr. Putin and the Syrian surrogates have been unable to pursue this final crush that they were hoping for in Idlib. But again, there's no good guys. There's no vanguard that is positive. It is simply major powers looking to secure their own interests. 
The United States largely aligned with Israel and Jordan on one side, who are in league to a degree with the Kurds. Then you have Mr. Putin, the Iranians, and the Assad regime on the other side. And then there is ISIS and Al-Qaeda who are fighting both. And then there are Turks, the Turkish government of Mr. Erdogan, who one day are on one side and another day on another side, depending on the issue, being against the Americans and Israelis concerning the position of support for the Kurds, at the same time opposing Mr. Putin, Iran, and Assad concerning the efforts to crush Idlib as the last holdout. It is a big, convoluted mess. A big, convoluted mess. Yet this week, Mr. Tagib Erdogan will again be meeting at Sochi with Mr. Putin this week in prophecy. Watch this space. It is such a confused embroglio that the players and alliances and loyalties can change almost day by day. As it is, the final thrust has been halted due to the pressure from the United States and the opposition by Turkey. Again, Russia and Iran want Turkey as a partner, very much resembling the Gog-Magog scenario of Ezekiel 38 and 39 in the opinion of many observers, certainly many evangelical Christians. On the other hand, Turkey has its own interest and will oppose Assad by backing anti-Assad forces in some conditions. But the anti-Assad forces are dominated by radical Muslims who persecute Christians, who have allegiances to Al-Qaeda or even ISIS, whom the United States and Russia are both fighting with. It is convoluted beyond description. But let's continue looking at what's transpiring this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Israeli Defense Forces, its medical corps largely, have begun to wind down the humanitarian aid it was providing to Syrian war refugees. Although aid will continue, certainly, for Druzis who have family inside Israel, 7,000 people were treated in Israeli military field hospitals along the Golan Heights border with Syria, and another 1,300, most of them children, were treated in Israeli hospitals. Uh, additionally, many tons of humanitarian aid, particularly baby food, baby health products, and things of this nature, were provided freely by the Israelis to the Syrian war refugees. Some Syrians realize that their real enemy is their own government, not their own people. And Israel does not wish to be their enemy. This adds only to the confused state of what once upon a time had been a cohesive Syria that is now a divided nation with different realms of control, the East still being in the hands of the United States and its allies under the influence of the USA, Israel, Jordan, and so forth, while most of the rest of the country is in the hands of the Putin-backed Assad regime in league with Iran and then, of course, the remaining rebels themselves. There doesn't seem to be any logical way out of this. It's almost impossible to understand it. Some of these people, like Syria, are allied with the United States or Israel in certain interests, but opposing the USA and Israel in other interests. Uh, there's no clear black and white, red, blue, no clear lines of demarcation. Everything is fluid, everything shifts, and it is nothing but chaos. We have no doubt that these things relate to the prophecies of Isaiah chapter 17, this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, Mr. Putin's hand was again forced by Mr. Trump to back down. Remember, the Americans killed up to 300 Russian mercenaries already in eastern Syria on the banks of the Euphrates. Mr. Putin does not want that to happen again. He became used to dealing with a weak American administration, as did the Israelis, 
who humiliated the United States under the regime of Barack Obama and of John Kerry seizing the American naval personnel in the Persian Gulf. This does not work and will not wash with Mr. Putin. Mr. Putin knows America will certainly stand up to Iran if it's stood up to Russia. Nonetheless, that is what is evolving this week in prophecy. At the same time these things are happening, the Israeli National Security Advisor, Maya Ben Shabbat, is going to Moscow for talks. Putin is keen to avoid further conflict with Israel or with the United States, while at the same time wanting to keep Assad in power. The Israelis do not want Assad in power as long as he's aligned with Iran, but at the same time, the alternative could be an ISIS or a Al-Qaeda-led regime of rebels. Thus, damned if you do, damned if you do not. It is only in eastern Syria where you have an American presence that there's any stability, largely among the Syrian Kurdish population. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy. Uh, we have seen the arrest of the two sons of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, uh, implicated in stock market violations after the sale of the Al Watani Bank. The Arab Spring has never ended. It is an ongoing saga, an ongoing episode. It began some time ago, but it's never really ended. It has continual ramifications, not only in Syria, but certainly in the political realm, in Egypt, ongoing struggles in Libya, certainly Yemen. It was not something that transpired several years ago. It is something that began several years ago and is still very much transpiring, often to the point of military conflict, armed conflict, but certainly to the point of political infighting that we see in Egypt. Quite a thing, but it's happening. And all of these events are not without their prophetic significance and ramifications. This week in prophecy. We continue to urge prayer for the Trump administration and for the government of Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel, and also the Lord's protection on American and Israeli and other allied forces in the struggle against radical Islam and Iranian fundamentalism. Prayer is the key. May the Lord give our leaders courage, wisdom, and grace. And may the God of salvation use these traumatic events to cause people, both Jew and Arab and Persian and Kurd, and Russian, and American, Jordanian, to come to a saving knowledge of the truth in Jesus. He is the only hope and the only one who can ultimately sort out this mess, this prophetic quagmire that we call the Middle East. This Week in Prophecy, God bless and thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.